Eli Stokels of Political joins me now from Washington to talk about all this. Eli, thanks for being here. Sure, Vlad. Good to be with you. So the pressure is on for Donald Trump after splitting states this past weekend with Ted Cruz. Now, even though the polls show him leading in both Michigan and Mississippi, is there anything standing in his way of more wins? Well, I mean, March 15th, a week from tonight, that's the uh, that's the big obstacle, perhaps, if Marco Rubio can win Florida or if John Kasich can win Ohio tonight. I think pretty clear that Trump's going to win in Mississippi. He's just bulldozed across the South, been very strong in that region. Uh, Michigan, probably a good fit for Donald Trump, although John Kasich seems to be closing very strong there. Ted Cruz also polling well there, but um, probably a long shot to see John Kasich somehow um, you know, get ahead of Donald Trump and finish first, but but uh, will be interesting to see who picks up delegates there. I think Trump's going to have a good night. You know, for Ted Cruz and for Marco Rubio, who are sitting out there today arguing that uh, you know everybody has to consolidate. I'm the only person to beat Donald Trump. Donald Trump's crazy. They've been howling at the moon. Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, all the establishment folks have been howling at the moon, trying to convince Trump supporters that he's crazy or not substantive. Not working. Those people are with Donald Trump, and I don't think tonight is going to really change the uh, overall dynamic in this race very much because Donald Trump's going to probably notch at least one win, probably two, um, and that sort of leaves the status quo uh, intact as we look forward to the 15th. Uh, Eli, the other thing that his rivals have been hammering him on, Donald Trump that is, is Trump University. So the Better Business Bureau came out today and said that they haven't had a rating for the company since September of 2015. Previously, it fluctuated between a D minus and an A plus. That sounds like my college career. Um, but will this issue ever affect voters? I mean, they don't seem to care about the things that a lot of these candidates are raising. Trump University, Trump Steaks, Trump Vodka. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things with Donald Trump, people already know. They're baked into the cake. Everybody knows he's been married three times. Everybody assumes that a guy who's been in New York real estate and doing deals this long, not every deal uh, is going to be a good one or a clean one. So I think a lot of uh, Trump supporters are willing to forgive those things. Trump University is an interesting one because if they were defrauding people who were trying to pay hard-earned money for college degrees, college credits, that would be something you would think might resonate with some of these people, might make people think twice about whether Donald Trump is who he says he is. But, you know, the person who was really prosecuting that attack over the last week or 10 days has been Marco Rubio. And I think it's the way that Marco Rubio has decided to go after Donald Trump, at least initially uh, after the, not this last debate, but the one before that in Houston, when Rubio really opened up the, uh, you know, threw the kitchen sink at him and then came out and was really mocking him. And they sounded like, you know, junior high kids on the, uh, the playground, the way they were going back and forth. Uh, when you're talking about you know, a candidate's hands, their manhood, whatever the case may be, that's a distraction. That is something that is going to obscure the larger point you're trying to make about Trump University, which is probably uh, a more relevant point to the conversation and more germane to voters. But I think a lot of voters were turned off by Marco Rubio's tone. And really now we're seeing a lot of people, you know, Rubio went hard after Trump for several days. Rubio seems to be uh, worse for having done so. Uh, that may have helped Ted Cruz. It may not have helped Donald Trump that people are hearing all this uh, stuff about him. But it's often not the person doing the attacks who benefits, even if those attacks hit uh, the mark. All right, Eli, stand by. I want to bring in our elections uh, director, Anthony Salvano. He's joining me here on the set. Good to see you, Anthony. Hey, Vlad, how are you? Good, good. So let's crunch some numbers. Michigan is the place with the most delegates at stake tonight. Walk us through what we should expect tonight. Well, as folks tune in, watching on CBSN for coverage when we start up, polls close at 9 o'clock. And right after that, the first thing I'm going to be watching is, can Donald Trump hold on to the lead that he has in the polls? And I say that because in state after state, he's been up in polls, but then we've seen him do better on the absentee ballots that are cast beforehand than he does with the late deciders and the folks who then come in on election day. Now, he's still won those states, but the margins get a little tighter. So even though he's had this double-digit lead coming into Michigan, I'm looking to see whether that shrinks down, even if he's in the lead, if that gets down into single digits. And that's telling. If he can't rally those late deciders, those people at the uh, on election day, that could speak to his ground organization, or it could speak to whether or not he can kind of seal up that, uh, that last-minute voter. Mm. Anthony, we're, we're talking about four Republican primaries today, but the focus a lot of the discussion is still looking ahead to March 15th, Florida, winner-take-all state. Big, big, big ramifications for the candidate who wins that state. Um, Ted Cruz has said that he can actually still find a path to the nomination. He can still find his way to 1237, those delegates that are needed to win the GOP nomination, even if he doesn't win Florida or Ohio. 
Is this math sound? Uh, it's mathematically possible. The political reality always wins out over the mathematical reality, frankly, because what happens is that as states hold these big delegate prizes, then somebody wins them, not only takes the lead, but then gets all the attention and all the spotlight goes on them for having won. Voters in subsequent state states take notice of that, and things tend to cascade. Now, I don't know that that will happen this year, per se, but it's very hard to see somebody who doesn't win Florida and doesn't win Ohio then ramping up suddenly and turning it around in where? Then you tell me which states he goes to, right? right? Connecticut, New York, California. You know, we could go on with this, and that, you know, that certainly might be a possibility, but you'd have to point to the states to say where does he start to catch up. Eli, uh you know, look, I want to know if you're reporting, if you've come across this in your reporting, the fact that if Marco Rubio has, doesn't do well today, um, and the polls continue to show Donald Trump leading him in Florida, does he continue on to Florida? Because, I mean, you guys are the experts, but I can't remember when a sitting U.S. senator has lost his state. I mean, Al Gore, I guess, lost Texas and uh, lost Tennessee in the general um, way back when. But this would be a huge, huge embarrassment. So, are you hearing that he may even decide to drop out before Florida if the numbers um, continue to show this? There was one CNN report to that effect yesterday that I think is uh, fairly erroneous. I think that's based on speculation from a donor who's looking at exactly what you're looking at, and everyone's looking at the polls showing that Marco Rubio is in danger of losing his home state, and that, yes, that would be embarrassing. But this campaign is in this through Florida, at least through Florida, um, probably done if they don't win Florida, and they know that. They won't say it publicly. But, you know, at this point, just would be just as embarrassing for them to end the campaign a week before Florida than to drop out right afterwards after losing. I mean, that's basically an admission that uh, we know we're not going to win Florida. So whether they actually, you know, did it this week or, you know, on the 16th, um, still not going to be a great situation for a guy who seemed to have a very uh, bright political future and may yet, you know, it's still very early and we get sort of myopic and look, looking at the conventional wisdom and the state of play as we see it each day. Um, you know, right now, what all of these campaigns, aside from Donald Trump, are trying to do is to put themselves in the best position to be a strong number two going into Cleveland. Ted Cruz won't say it, but really that's the reality for him as well. They all want to be the clear alternative to Donald Trump at the convention. Uh, they won't say it just yet, but that's the best hope Kasich's got. That's the, uh, the best hope that Rubio has. And so that's really what they're looking at. Uh, no Nobody's going to get to 1237 other than perhaps Donald Trump. Uh, and at this point, it's really just a numbers game. If Rubio wins the 99 delegates in Florida, then yeah, he stays in it and he's viable and it's a slog through a lot of those northern states. But you know, if he doesn't and say John Kasich wins in Ohio, uh, then that's very complicating too because he's going to stay in. And then Cruz, Kasich, and Trump, you still have two people splitting the non Trump vote. Uh, and this thing could go on for several months longer. Uh, I want to play for you both. Uh, Vice President Biden made an interesting observation about the GOP, uh, GOP race right now. Take a listen. If Ronald Reagan were alive today, seeking the nomination, he could no more get the nomination of the Republican Party than I could get the nomination. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not joking. And so what you see is this movement to the extreme in the Republican Party. So, Eli, what do you make of his comparison? We had Peggy, uh, Peggy Noonan on our set yesterday. She was a former speechwriter for President Reagan, and she said that he might not recognize the GOP were he alive today. What do you make of that? Oh, I think that's true. I think this party has moved uh, very far to the right in really just the past 10 years or so, really since the 2004 election uh, in which a lot of social conservatives were promised one thing, started to feel like the second term of the Bush presidency didn't really deliver. And then after the, uh, after the election of Barack Obama in 2008, really saw a strong reaction from the grassroots of the Republican Party, the Tea Party emerging, the 2010 election. And really, you have seen the base of the Republican Party move further and further away from its donor class, from the establishment in Washington, D.C. Um, it held in 2012 the party still able to nominate Mitt Romney because there was no credible alternative who could really uh, unite a plurality of Republican voters and really, you know, unite the base of the party. But in Donald Trump, uh, ironically enough, 
the party has found, you know, the, the most conservative voters uh, in the Republican Party, in the Republican base, um, are uniting behind a Manhattan billionaire. Uh, it just, it, it, is, it is hard to fathom, and that's why all these predictions about what would happen with Trump, you know, months ago have turned out to be false. But he has struck a chord, has resonated with this base, and he has been a formidable enough uh, figure and an adroit enough politician that he's managed to hold this together for months and months and months and really threatens the Republican establishment in a way that a, a singular standard bearer uh, had yet to do, even though we've seen this, this drift rightward from the base of the party going back at least a decade. Anthony, what do you make of that? I mean, we also talked to Peggy about Barry Goldwater, the guy who led one of the big Republican revolutions in 1964, and towards the end of his life, he was concerned with the influence of the Christian coalition on the GOP. He wasn't really a, a religious kind of a guy. Um, do you see major differences with with what Donald Trump has awakened in the GOP versus what we saw back in 64, 76, 1980? I think the Reagan comparison, you have to look at it on two levels. On, on the numerical side, just the number of people who call themselves conservative, the number of issues on which they are conservative, yes, has risen over time. We don't see as much even split ticket and crossover voting as we did back in the 1980s. All of that is true. But I think from a historical perspective, a lot of conservatives look at the Reagan presidency in its context as compared to what it was coming out of the 1970s at which they saw was you know the the liberal ascendancy and I think one of the appeals of looking at it for them is that they see then another possible transformation again in a time when we find in polls conservatives feel like the liberals are winning they feel like liberals are getting a lot of the policy things that they want whether or not that's the case that's how they feel and so they are looking for a switch back to a conservative governance again in the same way that they got it in Ronald Reagan following the 1970s. And so I think it's that historical context that matters as much as, and to them, that matters as much. Let me ask you about Trump supporters. Uh, Ted Cruz is on the campaign trail talking about this ceiling that Donald Trump has, right, nationally. He can only get 35%. But we've seen some polls that say that's not necessarily true. What do our numbers show? I mean, does Donald Trump, and we know that his supporters are sticky. They're sticking with him. Yes. But can he get past that threshold of the 35, 36 percent? He can get a little bit past it. So what we see is that if people were to drop out, where would those voters go? And when we ask voters that, you know, about a quarter of them for each candidate for a Cruz, for a Rubio, say that they could come to Trump. Now, importantly for Trump, that could be enough to get him near 50 percent. But what we also see is that it's not really more than that. And so he does still have this ceiling. But then again, all of these candidates, in some respects, appear to have ceilings. So it's relative, right? As other candidates have dropped out, they haven't all, all these voters haven't coalesced behind the last few stand. They haven't all coalesced behind a Kasich or a Cruz or a Rubio yet. So there is still a little bit of uh, shopping going on among, among a good portion of the Republican base, even the ones who've already decided that they're not backing Donald Trump. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to the Democrats in just a moment. One quick question, Anthony, before I go back to Eli and the Democrats. Um, Ted Cruz is saying a vote for uh, Marco Rubio or John Kasich is a vote for Donald Trump. Marco Rubio is saying a vote for John Kasich or Ted Cruz is a vote for Donald Trump. What do our numbers say? Well. Like I said, they are, there is a segment of the Republican base, and it is maybe 40-odd percent, maybe 30 yeah. percent, that has effectively ruled out at this point voting for Donald Trump. So they're jockeying for, for those folks. And that actually depends state by state as you go along, right? So we're not talking about a national, national number here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, in the various states that are coming up. So... When they get to look for those numbers, they're looking to take those votes and then build up and become one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump. And they, they could do that, potentially. But I do think there's a lane also for John Kasich versus Marco Rubio's voters, because they tend to horse trade a little bit among the smaller, but, but they're there, group that are looking for a more establishment candidate.